All right, guys, how's it going? So I was thinking back a couple of years ago to the Polaris and Pascal launches and thinking about how exciting it was. We had been on 28 nanometers for five years and we'd all got pretty desperate for the new 14 and 16 nanometer graphics technology. And there were tons of leaks. Lots of demonstrations, mostly coming from AMD it has to be said, and from all of that I created three videos, my Polaris versus Pascal analysis. Now I think it's safe to say that these videos were somewhat hit and miss. The Nvidia portion was definitely a hit. It practically nailed everything about Pascal, including the performance, the price, the power, but with Polaris I was out by a fair distance it has to be said. We didn't realise then that Polaris simply didn't scale that well with extra clock speed, not in the way Pascal does, and ultimately the clock speed was far far down on the Pascal competition, and that really is why there was a gap there. But there's also no question that AMD did not turn up for the fight. They launched these Polaris 10 and Polaris 11 graphics cards. Polaris 10 was seen in the flagship Radeon RX 480, but it only had a die size of 232 square millimetres, which is squarely in the mid-range. And Polaris 11, that was the RX 460, with a die size of 123 square millimetres, so that was squarely in the entry level. Those were the two chips that AMD launched on 14 nanometers, whereas Nvidia launched the GeForce GTX 1080 with a die size of 314 square millimetres, which is 35% larger. Now, the GTX 1080 was by far and away faster than the RX 480, and what's more, the power draw of this much faster card was not all that much more than the RX 480. With Pascal and Polaris, Nvidia simply had the better gaming architecture. Back then we didn't know that RTG or the Radeon Technologies Group, with their leader Raja Kaduri seen here. We didn't know that they were in some disarray with claims of infighting and the wrong strategies. Kaduri himself even went as far as telling an investor meeting that the company had lost focus on graphics some time ago. So we waited on Vega, and we waited and we waited, but regarding that, the writing was on the wall months earlier. Vega flopped from a gaming perspective, wholly unable to match the 1080 Ti, while using far more power. And again, Pascal was simply a better gaming architecture. It wasn't long before Raja was taking a sabbatical before joining Intel as their new chief architect for their new cores and visual computing group. To be joined later by the Radeon Technology Group's senior marketing director, Chris Hook. And at some point in the middle of this, I simply gave up caring. Graphics card prices were crazy because of mining, and yet the competition had been at its lowest point ever. It's safe to say that 2017 was the worst year for graphics in history, and so far, in 2018, it's been little better. And that's why I have barely been talking about graphics for the past year plus. Two years ago, we were all excited. Are you excited today? Well, maybe just a little bit. And this video today is for me. It is for me to catch back up, to get back into the loop of all the stuff I have basically been ignoring or paying scant attention to over the past year or so. So I'm going to take a look at all the architectures, current and future, to try and figure out where we stand today. So looking at Pascal, which we've had for just over two years, and the final real graphics card we got of the series was the GTX 1070 Ti, which was minimum effort. I say the 1070 Ti was the final Pascal card. Of course, Nvidia's been rolling out some crazy stuff like GeForce GT 1030 with DDR4, but I'm not even going to bother counting these as gaming graphics cards. Basically speaking, Pascal was finished with the GTX 1070 Ti. We should expect no more Pascal cards unless we get more crap like this. And at the tail end of 2017, the talk around NVIDIA was all about Volta. But over at the German website HiSE Online, we first caught wind of the codename Ampere. A month later, NVIDIA did indeed release their Volta architecture with the $3,000 Titan V. Now, Pascal is aimed squarely at the gaming market, and Volta is a compute card. These cards are built for the data center, machine intelligence, deep learning. But the raw specs of these cards facilitate excellent gaming performance. 
The Titan V has 5,120 CUDA cores and a boost clock of around 1,455 MHz. So that is 43% more CUDA cores than the GTX 1080 Ti, which even though has higher clock speeds, can never make up that huge gap in CUDA cores. And what that meant was the Titan V was around 25-30% faster than the GTX 1080 Ti. The secret behind this monstrous Volta Titan V was the improved 12 nanometer process. The Pascal generation was 16 nanometers, but Nvidia had paid their foundry partner TSMC for a custom 12 nanometer node, allowing for massive graphics chips, 815 square millimeters in size, by far and away the largest graphics chip ever seen. The 1080 Ti and Titan XP were already 35% faster than AMD's Vega 64. It goes without saying that the Titan V absolutely smashed Vega, but Volta wasn't really meant for gaming. It just happened to be very good at it through sheer brute force. But certainly from a gamer perspective, the Volta architecture came and went with the $3000 Titan V. An extremely important part about analysis is knowing how far to trust your sources, and it's fair to say that I trust some sources more than others. So when back in early February of this year, and Joel Hruska over at Extreme Tech, while touring Global Foundry's Fab 8, dropped this interesting snippet. Global Foundry's is skipping 10 nanometers altogether, which we knew, and heading straight to 7 nanometers with an AMD Vega chip designed for machine intelligence workloads, apparently serving as a so-called pipe cleaner to test the design and its capabilities. Now, Global Foundries is no stranger to graphics these days, but the consensus would still have been Vega fabricated at TSMC instead. This was very curious to me, and I would expect a pipe cleaner to be a small chip which doesn't really go with the whole Vega design for machine intelligence workloads. I would expect that to be a large chip. But as I was saying, evaluating your sources is very important, and I would consider Joel to be one of the better ones. So for me, this was a real curiosity, and one that I've always had in the back of my mind. But we'll get back to Vega soon. As only a few days later, over at Reuters, and frenzied demand for Nvidia's graphics cards are shooting prices through the roof. By this point, almost impossible to get hold of any graphics card whatsoever. Even GTX 1060s were selling for $500. But the really interesting thing about this Reuters article was the leak of a new GPU gaming chip codenamed Turing, which was expected to be unveiled next month. We know that that didn't happen, but we've now got yet another codename from NVIDIA to go alongside Pascal, Volta and Ampere. Now around about February, NVIDIA's financial performance was just staggering. The amount of money they were making was incredible. And I made this video, NVIDIA Destined for Greatness, analysing their financial and competitive performance. And I made one or two statements in this video. The first one was, I believed mining to continue. And I was wrong about that because mining has really burst over the last couple of months. But in this video, I also talked about how NVIDIA will get their timing perfect when releasing their next architecture. Due to the lack of competition, there is nothing stopping NVIDIA from staggering releases, holding cards back, run down Pascal just in time for the new upcoming Turing architecture, and we'll also see how well that prediction panned out later on in this video. Moving on to March, and it was all about one thing. Ray tracing. NVIDIA launched their RTX technology, realising their dream of real-time cinematic rendering. And on the same day, Microsoft announced their DXR API, DirectX ray tracing. All of this ray tracing stuff sort of exploded onto the scene during GDC 2018. That is of course the Game Developers Conference. And I recently watched this video, The Ray and Raster Era Begins, an R&D roadmap for the game industry presented by NVIDIA. And it's pretty telling stuff in this. Very interesting video in fact, also very technical. By now we are all aware of the kind of company NVIDIA is. And while watching through this, it became very clear to me that whether or not ray tracing becomes the next big thing, NVIDIA will be heavily pushing for it anyway. And the reason for this has to be that their cards, current and future, future being far more important here, will almost certainly have some advantageous ray tracing capability. Over at NVIDIA's news page, we learn about GameWorks for ray tracing, which will support Volta and future generations 
Generation GPU architectures. This is going to enable ray traced area shadows, ray traced glossy reflections and ray traced ambient occlusion. And the whole point of this Ray and Raster Era Begins video was basically to convince artists that it is now time to begin implementing more ray tracing. The reason why they're not getting rid of rasterization altogether is that ray tracing is still incredibly computationally expensive. But by introducing it gently, NVIDIA's upcoming graphics series will still perform great in the Raster Era games while pulling far ahead when ray tracing is used. If you think that's a little bit like planned obsolescence, then you think the same as me. On the flip side, of course, technology has to move forward. And we saw this and some in the Reflections real-time ray tracing demo done in Unreal Engine and with some extremely high-end NVIDIA hardware. This was in fact a combination of rasterization and ray tracing. And we of course know that NVIDIA get on very well with Epic Games. So perhaps no surprise where over at Fudzilla we learn that NVIDIA will launch a GPU that everyone calls Turing this year for both AI and gaming applications. A GPU that should appear before the end of the year, probably around Q3 in 2018. Turing will be fast, it will do gaming much better and it will perform ray tracing better than anything before. Fudzilla actually have very good sources, some of the best sources in the industry, although perhaps the analysis isn't always perfect. But simply put, I have no reason to disbelieve that Turing will be fast and it will also have something in there to help with ray tracing and it is very likely that ray tracing will be the big marketing point when Turing launches. And by now we've kind of got a roadmap. Nvidia hasn't launched their own roadmap for a long time. But Turing comes at the end of this year and Ampere will come after that. Exactly what Ampere is? We're still not entirely sure. A few days later, still at Fudzilla, and we learn that Vega 7 nanometer is not a GPU. And the current plan says it will never be. What Fudzilla is calling Vega 7, according to both Lisa Su and a few others at AMD's January technology gig, was always presented as an instinct artificial intelligence product. That has always been AMD's main focus, and some other people high up in the GPU hierarchy at AMD have repeatedly confirmed that Vega 7 nanometers is an AI chip and not a GPU. This got me thinking, what if this is actually true? What if this upcoming 7 nanometer Vega chip was literally developed only for AI? We've heard nothing to suggest that Vega on 7 nanometers will ever see the light of day as a consumer product. Literally nothing. But assuming it is actually a fully functional GPU, another reason could simply be pricing, as GPUs powered by HBM2 are really quite expensive. We'll get back to Vega soon though, because at the beginning of June at Computex, we learned that NVIDIA's CEO Jensen Huang said it will be a long time before the next generation GeForce GPUs are seen. By this point, we believe believe it's Turing of course, but we're getting mixed messages. Some in the press were expecting it within a month back in February, but not for the first time Nvidia CEO is saying it's a very long time before we're gonna see the new series, just keep on buying Pascal. A couple of weeks later and an article over at Semi Accurate, it's behind a paywall so we don't know the exact details, but it turns out that one of Nvidia's add-in board partners, one of the top three Taiwanese companies, which means it's either Asus, MSI or Gigabyte, one of those three partners returned 300,000 Pascal GPUs back to NVIDIA. And essentially what had happened was, NVIDIA had been throwing more and more cards at their partners, and they were all being gobbled up because of cryptocurrency mining. But as soon as that burst, as I talked about in that NVIDIA Destined for Greatness video, when cryptocurrency mining burst, NVIDIA could find themselves in a situation with an awful lot of cards that they will have to sell before the new series is launched. Looking at Gigabyte's June sales, it was an unusually weak month for GPUs. And this is why the 300,000 GPUs have been returned to NVIDIA. The channel is now stocked full with graphics cards that will have to be sold before NVIDIA even considers launching. Launching Turing. And Turing will be delayed until all of those Pascal cards are sold. But Nvidia's timing here, perhaps not as perfect as I anticipated, but they will get the second best result, even if that means delaying Turing by half a year. Let's face it, AMD's 
got nothing to compete with Pascal. Anyway, this fact was brought home to us again at Computex, where AMD demoed the world's first 7 nanometer GPU, while once again stating categorically that this was for machine learning and artificial intelligence applications, not for gaming. Lisa actually showed us the die. It looks to me around about 360 square millimeters, and we can see four stacks of HBM2 as well, of course. So early on the 7 nanometer process, 360 square millimeters is actually a pretty large chip. And it's possible that this is the pipe cleaner that Joel over at Extreme Tech was talking about back in February. Again, very, very large for a pipe cleaner, but if you're going to be making the product anyway, it might make some kind of sense. It could also, of course, be from TSMC. But my analysis of this is it is probably a Global Foundries product. The Vega presentation ended with Lisa saying, for all you gamers out there, we are definitely bringing 7 nanometer GPUs to gaming as well, so stay tuned on that. There was no mention of 7 nanometer Vega GPUs. Now the thing about this is, with such a large GPU, on a new process, you would expect there to be quite a few defective parts. Normally these defective parts, or the worst performing parts, would end up on the desktop. That's what Vega 64 is, and Vega 56. Nvidia does the exact same thing, with their Titan V. So the logic would have said that this Vega 7 nanometers would probably see the light of day on the desktop at least the worst of the silicon. However, in this case, with a chip designed specifically for the data center, very low volume chip, low volume, high margins, there simply wouldn't be enough defective parts to make a new gaming series out of. And again, it comes back to that HBM thing. I have it on good authority that AMD is losing money on HBM2 on every desktop card they sell. Even Vega 64, HBM2 is still so expensive that they're losing money on it. You have to ask yourself, why on earth would they even bother? And finally, how much faster can this be? Also at Computex, we saw the Radeon Technology Group's new leader, David Wang, and we got an idea of what to expect from the new Vega. Performance greater than 1.35x. This is simply based on the process itself. I would expect it to be a lot faster than that, but even if this incoming 7 nanometer Vega was 50% faster than Vega 64, that would still just put it ahead of the Titan XP and still behind the Titan V, let alone what's coming with Turing. Why would AMD even bother launching that card? And the most likely answer to that is, they won't. I heard a rumour a few months ago that they may launch a 2GPU RX Vega on 7 nanometers, but I'm taking that rumour with a very large pinch of salt. Also in June, a pretty interesting exclusive over at WCCF, the AMD Inside Story and the Navi GPU Roadmap. That's a pretty good article over at WCCF, and I'll touch on the implications of this towards the end of the video. Now in previous videos I speculated that for Nvidia's next series, they would almost certainly copy what they did in the transition between Kepler and Maxwell. Kepler arrived in 2012 and then Maxwell 2014. It was all the same 28 nanometer node. 2012 was obviously pretty early in the 28 nanometer lifetime, but when Maxwell first arrived, the process was much more mature. Due to the more mature process, these larger chips were now economically viable, and this was one of the reasons why Maxwell was so fast. They were pretty large GPUs compared to what had gone before, so I expected them to do something very similar on 16 nanometers, and of course we already knew that Nvidia had a custom 12 nanometer process now. The logic was simple, Nvidia's next architecture is almost certainly going to be 12 nanometers at TSMC, and late last month it would appear that that's exactly what we're getting. Over at Reddit, a software guy showed a picture of an Nvidia board he was testing. We no longer have the picture on Reddit, as the OP has deleted his post. The way things are today though, that's never going to be a problem. Here was was the development board, which came with three 8-pin power connectors, 12 modules of Micron's GDDR6 memory. That's pretty interesting. And there was no actual GPU on the board, but that's a pretty large area left for a chip. As it turns out, you could fit maybe a 676 square millimeter GPU onto this board. As you remember, GV100, the Titan V, was 815 square millimeters. GP102, that's your Titan XP and your 1080 Ti, is only 471 square millimeters, and the logic would suggest that the upcoming Turing Titan or 1180 Ti will likely come in around the 
600 to 650 square millimeter mark, which is a very, very large gaming GPU. And this is, of course, the thing because Volta was not a gaming GPU. 650 square millimeters of pure gaming grunt? This is going to be pretty fast. Nvidia knows their market pretty well, so this will come in 25 30% faster than the current Titan XP. There's little reason to believe otherwise. Essentially, I believe Turing to be an evolution of Pascal. Why would they change a clearly winning formula? But again, with the aforementioned ray tracing elements, just for that little bit extra. The interesting thing for me about Turing is, assuming this very large 650mm squared GPU is the 1180 Ti, or the next true gaming titan, what's going to happen with the 1180 and the 1160? I mean, theoretically, and something I've mentioned before, Nvidia could just rebrand the current 1080 Ti into the 1180, and they could sell that for $700 plus, and it will sell for that price. But that's going to lack any of these new ray tracing elements that I expect to see see in this 1180 Ti. So the question here is, will we see a whole new series with Turing top to bottom or are we just going to see the highest end? My hope is that we see a whole new top to bottom series. But as I talked about in my previous video, every new GPU, that's a new mask costing maybe 150, 200 million dollars. It's a lot of money. It is money that Nvidia would recoup easily. But the sad fact here is they would make the same money with a rebranded 1080 Ti. When you see this though, again you understand the utter futility of AMD releasing a 7 nanometer Vega. There would not appear to be any possibility of that 360 millimeter squared Vega being able to compete with this 12 nanometer Turing behemoth. Now this video has already covered quite a lot of ground, but I'm going to finish off with something that will depress a great many of you. We started to see one or two articles suggesting that perhaps Navi was created first of all for the Sony PlayStation 5 rather than PC, and also that this is one of the reasons why Vega suffered so badly on the desktop. This Forbes article was pretty similar to the WCCF article on the same day. The point was fairly clear. AMD's gaming focus is on game consoles, and a day later we got this really interesting article over at PC Games N, when we discovered that AMD's Navi will be a traditional monolithic GPU, not a multi-chip module. Now, Obviously, the chiplet thing is a massive part of my channel, but when PC Games N interviewed David Wang, he said, We are looking at the MCM type of approach, but we've yet to conclude that this is something that can be used for traditional gaming graphics type of application. And he continued, to some extent, you're talking about doing Crossfire on a single package. The challenge here though is that unless they make it invisible to the independent software vendors or your game developers, you're going to see the same sort of reluctance. We know that AMD has gone down that path on the CPU side, but the GPU has unique constraints with this type of NUMA, non-uniform memory access architecture and how you combine features. When asked if it was possible to make a GPU MCM design invisible to a game developer, Wang said, anything's possible. It got even more interesting later on though, because the MCM approach is only an issue in the gaming world. The professional space is much more accepting of multi-GPU and MCM designs. As AMD's Scott Herkelman said, in professional and instinct workloads, multi-GPU is considerably different. We are all in on that side. Gaming on the other hand has to be enabled and the developers see it as a tremendous burden. So does that mean that we might end up seeing diverging GPU architectures for the professional and consumer space? Perhaps enabling MCM on one side and not the other. With Wang saying, yeah, I can definitely see that. So that appears to be a rather large nail in the coffin of the whole multi-chip GPU thing, at least from the gamer perspective. And this got me thinking pretty hard. The issue here is on the software side. And historically, the Radiant Technologies group has failed to convince game developers to use even what was vastly superior technology. Old ATI had tessellation for years, it never got used. As soon as Nvidia had it in DX11, they spread it everywhere. But AMD still continues with these forward thinking architectures. The problem is, on the PC, game developers can't be bothered and they will not waste resources on what is a diminishing AMD presence in PC gaming. It's a catch-22 and it just made me realise that Nvidia is in utter control of PC gaming. 
streaming, NVIDIA's new Turing architecture will have some new ray tracing feature and it will get used. You can bet it will be used because they will force the issue. And with AMD's consistent failures to convince game developers to get on board, I have essentially come to the conclusion that while they haven't completely given up, they will release Navi on the desktop. It will come next year, possibly even before we see Ampere, but it won't be faster than the 1180 Ti. It may not even be as fast as the 1180. We know that Nvidia has split their GPU lines, their compute and their machine learning architecture, which is Volta, and their gaming architecture, which is Pascal. Ampere may well be the next compute focused architecture. Turing seems certain to be the next gaming focused architecture. Nvidia has been doing this for many years now, but I had an epiphany and realised that so has AMD because Polaris was their gaming architecture and Vega was their compute architecture. That was 14 nanometers and on 7 nanometers Vega is still their compute architecture. They're just not gonna bother releasing it on the desktop and their desktop architecture will be Navi but they're not competing at the high end just the same as they did not compete at the high end on 14 nanometers. Navi replacing Polaris? It's probably gonna be around the 300 square millimeter mark. Polaris was too small. That's why it lost so heavily. That chip should have been at least 300 square millimeters to stand any kind of chance. I'm pretty sure Navi will be a bigger GPU and it will compete better against Turing. But we're still talking the mid-range Turing here, not to the high end. And ultimately what this comes down to now is on 7 nanometers, on the new process, of course you prioritize the high margin chips. That's why Vega 7 nanometers is for AI. And that's why Epic the data center CPU will also be the first 7 nanometer CPU. These chips are worth a fortune, but they're also expensive to manufacture. And ultimately, if you look at a list of AMD's priorities, Epic are right at the very top. Then you've got Radeon Instinct, your 7 nanometer Vega, and after that, the focus is the game consoles. I would even put stuff like the PlayStation 5 and the next Xbox ahead of all your Ryzen CPUs, that's your laptop and your desktop. They are perhaps on a similar level. But make no mistake about it, PC graphics is at the very, very bottom of AMD's focus. Fudzilla reported that Navi was not a high-end GPU and then a bunch of them jumped on that bandwagon. And at first I thought, yeah, but that's fine because it's going to be an MCM. I expected Navi to be a chiplet architecture, but I am not about to disbelieve the Radeon Technology Group's new leader, David Wang, when he says it won't be a chiplet architecture. If he's saying it's a traditional monolithic GPU, you can believe him. It's a traditional monolithic. GPU and it is not high end. The only thing stopping AMD from releasing a high end Navi would be the cost of the photo mask, which on 7 nanometers could cost more than $300 million for one mask. That is one design. $300 million that AMD would need to recoup on one high end Navi graphics chip when AMD's entire graphics division didn't even make that in profit last year. What do you think the chances are of AMD wasting money on a chip like that? Nvidia on the the other hand, of course, they will recoup that money. But they're going to stagger out the releases and you'll get 12 nanometers first of all and 7 nanometers will come along just around about the time you're desperate enough to pay for it. And the final part of this would be, as I talked about, Nvidia being able to push their agenda, which will be hybrid rendering, a combination of ray tracing and rasterization. Nvidia will push this agenda and they will push it hard. AMD realized a long time ago that they can't do that on the PC, but they can force the issue on on the game consoles and I believe that that is what they are doing. Don't be surprised if the PlayStation 5 and Navi also implement ray tracing to a certain degree because you know both of these companies they basically come to the same conclusion every time. They just do it in different ways. Right and finally finishing this one off just over a week ago ASRock's GPU roadmap hints at no next generation Radeon until at least February 2019. Just a leaked roadmap. There is no Radeon RX 600 series in there or anything particularly new in fact. If you've been paying attention to this video, that will not surprise you. Over at Chip Hell though, which is the Chinese forum well known for hardware leaks, there was a post claiming that perhaps Polaris 30 was on its way. 12 nanometers with around 15% extra performance. Pascal and Volta may well be done, but it appears that maybe Polaris still isn't done. I'm sure that none of you are hanging by the neck waiting on this one, but this potential leak here reminded me of a video over at Gamers Nexus where Steve over there heard that AMD had ordered some 9 gigabits per second 
GDDR5. Faster memory would be a requirement for this 12 nanometer, 15% faster Polaris 30 if it arrives by early next year though I think it's probably right it will be a competitor card to an 1150 Ti or 1150 and it probably won't look too pretty in terms of performance per watt. So that's me done with this one. Like I said, it was really all about me getting back up to speed. There is every chance that I've missed something obvious. Maybe a big piece of news that just eluded me. If that's the case, feel free to let me know about it in the comments. But overall, from a gaming graphics perspective, competition looks to be deader than a dodo and about to get worse after Nvidia launches Turing. There's always a chance of a surprise or two. So you never know. I'll catch you later, guys.